Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're all doing well and uh, having a good uh, week so far. Obviously, only Wednesday, so halfway there. But uh, yeah, hope everyone is uh, is keeping well. Um, I just want to say, first of all, a big thank you for coming along and joining us today for what is the third and final installment of our spring webinar series for 2023. Um, thankfully, it's actually starting to feel a bit more like spring now, which is always a plus. So um, yeah, obviously, uh, keep on keep on moving forward in, in that respect. But um, yeah, obviously, a big thank you. Uh, great to have you all here. And um, just to quickly conduct initial introductions. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Fraser. I'm one of the customer success managers within the education team here at Vivox. And I'm also really pleased to say that I'm also joined by uh, Alex Pitchford here today as well. So Alex has very kindly given up his time to come and speak to you guys today all around his particular um, use cases and applications of Bbox within his teaching. Um, Alex is from a maths background, however, so obviously there's going to be uh, a bit of a spin on that uh, with a particular focus on uh, using Bbox in maths and science teaching. So I'm going to introduce Alex in a little bit more detail uh, ever so shortly before I eventually hand over to Alex himself. Um, but obviously, yeah, really appreciate you coming along here today, Alex, and, and giving up your time and obviously, you know, really looking forward to your uh, presentation. But just to introduce Alex a bit further, so as I say, Alex is a associate lecturer in maths, um, and Alex is joining us from Aberystwyth University in Wales. So Aberystwyth is a university we've actually worked with uh, for a number of years now. We've had the pleasure of working with them quite closely on a number of different webinars in the past. We actually ran a session um, in our series last year uh, with a gentleman called Bruce Fraser Wright. Um, and his session was all about using uh, VBOX for icebreakers. So if you haven't seen that one, um, I'd recommend you uh, having a look for that on our YouTube channel. It's definitely well worth a watch. So like I say, we're very fortunate to have a great relationship with them um, and obviously really pleased that Alex has given up his time today to come and speak to you guys as well. Now, like I say, Alex is from a uh, from a maths background, but previously before that, um, he was actually uh, within the IT industry and has quite recently transitioned back um, into academia, as you can see uh, from his biography on screen there in front of you. So I'll let you have a little read of that, uh, but I think I'm going to let Alex uh, in, uh, embellish that a little bit further himself. So Alex, I'm going to hand it over to, your, uh, to yourself at this point um, I will give you the, uh, the the power here and make you the presenter. So yeah as Fraser introduced I'm going to talk a little bit about my experiences of using VBOX in the teaching of maths uh, and we could also say sciences because mainly it's a focus on sort of numerical type questions uh, but uh, my experiences have been in the teaching of maths but most of this is uh, also applicable to say uh, any of the sciences really and perhaps even broader so we start off uh, with talking about my journey uh, into vbox and then look specifically my use in some action research projects which are something we do as part of our pgc the training and then through what i've been doing with vbox over the last uh, year or so uh, i picked up some little tips that i use and i'll share them with you uh, towards the end Let's go directly to my VBOX warm up. Here we go for a first poll then. So, following on from uh, the seeing the talk uh, by Bruce White and also uh, part of the training course, then this idea of having a sort of icebreaker is something I've used quite extensively. Uh, and I think it works pretty well. Certainly when people are using VBOX for the first time, then this idea of having an icebreaker, sort of the first uh, thing really is it allows people, well, allows you to check that everyone's connected, which is what I'm doing now. For the first time, I've seen that we've got uh, 14 people involved. And we can also check that everyone's able to use the technology before we get on to perhaps uh, more serious questions. So. There we go, perhaps 13 out of 14, it's a good response. And we see uh, the results. So, um, well, what a beautiful looking Gaussian type uh, response that is. So, uh, a, a nice spread and perhaps uh, good for the next few questions if we've got some people who feel reasonably confident in mathematics. So, here we go for our next one. So, so for people who are perhaps a little maths phobic, then the idea that somebody might present them with, here's a maths problem for you to solve, might send them into 
uh, some kind of uh, emotional turmoil. And so let's see how people are going to describe their emotions when posed with a question like this one. So let's see the results uh, as they start to come through. And yes, these are the kind of things you'd expect to see. Uh, quite uh, happy to see and uh, excited there and nervous and excited. Confident. Uh, now this is a uh, this is a good one. Uh, let's see. I guess some of you probably will have predicted what's coming next. Here we go. So here's a math problem for you to solve. So this is an example of something or a similar question. In fact, probably I just copied it directly from uh, the second action research project that I'm going to talk about. And that was part of a, of a foundation year class. And pretty much, I think, the first lesson that they would have had with me uh, was doing sort of basic algebraic manipulations. So this was the kind of question I might have asked them to uh, solve this equation. And you'll see here that I perhaps, well, we'll see why I had to uh, sort of narrow this down to only positive values of x. This will become clear perhaps when we do the next question. So perhaps considering the number of mass phobes we had, perhaps this should be enough. And so let's have a look at the results. I see. Well, let's hope the person who is feeling confident is one of those 11 people who uh, got the correct answer there. And 75% will we'll, we'll always take that. So here we have perhaps another way of looking at the same question, which would expose the fact that there's more than one answer when you widen the range of values that X could take. And this would be your approach at how you might find it by factorizing this equation. It's a classic difference of two squares. Okay, so perhaps 11 out of 16 is enough there. So let's see the results. So a nice 40% of people. Uh, so those are my maths, uh, type, the type of maths questions I use. And now we'll return uh, to the slideshow. My journey then towards using VBOX. Well, as uh, Fraser introduced, I spent 15 years working in engineering stroke IT. I uh, then had a moment where I thought that perhaps I would be better placed uh, in the world of science. And so I spent eight years studying physics, so four years undergrad and then a PhD, which led on to a postdoc. Uh, all of this in Aberystwyth, by the way. And at, after, well, in my third year in a postdoc, a position became available. Uh, so these things don't happen very often. So I applied and I'm now in my third year as associate lecturer in mathematics here in Aberystwyth. Uh, and part of my role as associate lecturer is teaching these four modules. So those questions I showed you a moment ago were from my mathematics tutorial module, which is uh, for the foundation year. And I also do these two modules for the first year, one on probability and one on algebra and calculus. And then the other module, uh, which again, which is what I did my action research project with, is this introduction to statistics module. So how I came then specifically uh, to DBOX. So during my PhD, I took the PGC THE module one. And in this, we had various sort of lectures or classes or whatever. And uh, one of them was on uh, active learning. And I was very much sold on this idea. And my mentor, also a great proponent of it. And so while I was a PhD student, I have some teaching roles and I tried to incorporate some ideas of active learning into what I was doing then. But, but I had much more opportunity to do this when I actually started my lecturing. So I'm then coordinating modules. And so here then I made serious attempts at, at involving active learning so I could actually give students tasks to do during the lecture. And 
while you give them a task to do, you actually have quite a lot of opportunity to observe what they're doing. And for many of them, it looked clear that they weren't participating in the activity. Obviously, an activity involving mathematics usually involves people moving a pencil around on a piece of paper, and lots of people seem to be sitting there staring a little bit blank. Um, and so, and often it was the people that you were kind of thinking would benefit most from participating in an activity, as in, if you try to uh, use some mathematics, then it's much more likely to um, stick in your mind. So, anyway, uh, I was thinking of ways uh, to improve or increase participation levels, and then along came uh, the PGCTHE module two and the opportunity to do uh, some training uh, with the software VBOX. So, so, so I went along to the training course and we have a very good uh, learning and teaching enhancement unit here. And so my colleague Jim uh, actually tailed the course quite nicely for us in that uh, there weren't that many people on there. So he kind of put some mass questions in there Quite, quite a hard one, actually. Uh, so something about whether a matrix was positive, definite, definitely substantially more challenging than what I presented you with uh, just now. But uh, mainly it was showing off the fact that you could present mathematics in a nice way uh, using the software. And so I was pretty much sold at that moment that this must be something I can use in order to help achieve my teaching uh, objectives. So part of doing the PGC THE module two is that we do these things called uh, action research projects. And so uh, I think these are actually more general and they kind of suppose that we will continue doing these uh, for the rest of our teaching. And perhaps, I suppose perhaps we do, but not perhaps as formally. Uh, but so the idea of this first project was that I would use uh, VBOX uh, in revision sessions and we'll see the objectives of that uh, when we look at it in detail a bit later. Uh, so then, as that one was quite successful and uh, Project 2 came along, then I thought I would perhaps uh, get used to the same technology, uh, but for slightly different objectives. And so, so in this, this one, we were looking to try and find ways to help people uh, with learning algebraic problem solving. So now I pretty much use uh, VBOX in every lecture, not quite every lecture, but most of them. And the way I operate is that kind of we have a sort of five to 10 minute, everyone sort of getting into the lecture theater uh, at the beginning. And if I'm organized enough and everything works, I try to get that up five minutes before the lecture starts, I post you know, a reasonably difficult question, which they have to do uh, some working for. So, and then the moment the lecture starts, 10 past the hour, I open the poll and they can start, um, sorry, uh, then we sort of uh, look at the results of that poll and we move on from there, a few more easier questions. And so we kind of only take up five minutes of the lecture, uh, but it does give people an opportunity for active learning and uh, also allows me to you know judge whether people have, have learned anything from the last lecture. So also I plan to repeat the uh, sessions that I did for the first two action for the action research projects and so uh, the first one of those is coming up next week actually and so I will reuse those uh, VBOX sessions there and Again, use the same one for ARP2 in September. And so, so I kind of use it in every lecture, but use it more extensively in some others. So here we go. Uh, this was uh, Action Research Project 1. So we had these uh, objectives, which was to increase the participation uh, in the uh, problem solving in the class and to sort of uh, try and build confidence in the students because the exam is coming up pretty soon. And also, it's an idea 
Uh, for me, I can measure, you know, uh, how well people have learned the material, which was quite interesting in results of this. Uh, and also, we have this idea that if we could perhaps, uh, you know, generate a bit more excitement, then this would sort of uh, improve people's sort of experience of the classroom and make them more likely to attend more sessions, for instance. So specific use then of eBox in, in, uh, to do this. So the idea was it would encourage them to actually have a go at the exercises uh, rather than just sit there scratching their head. Uh, would allow through this sort of um, statistical feedback for me to determine how well they did when they tried completing the exercises and also provide uh, a bit of fun and we'll see from the result outcomes that it certainly did. So here we go. So that was uh, the plan and this is how we implemented it. So I wrote some exam style questions, uh, then uh, sort of put those together uh, in a presentation. I'll show you an example in a moment. And then we start the session with a VBOX warm up. So a few icebreaker questions. And then um, we move on to the questions which I prepared. So I will present the full question on a slide. Uh, so, because sometimes these can be a bit lengthy and perhaps not suitable for including all of it uh, in the eBox poll. And then I would ask the students to prepare an answer. So, this was another advantage in giving them uh, the question first because it means that if it happens to be a multiple choice one, then they can't use those options. To help guide them towards the answer, they actually have to derive the answer from what's presented on them in the question itself, just as it would be uh, in the exam, for instance. Uh, then I open the poll. They show a shortened version of the question, and uh, sometimes you'd have to separate things out because the poll only allows a single answer. So then I reveal the answer, and then I provide some instruction of how they could have got there or how they should have got there, for instance. Uh, and then we repeat uh, with, um, with more questions. So let's have a look then at an example of how this would have worked. So this then was uh, one of the warm-up questions. So kind of an icebreaker and an opportunity for me to judge uh, you know, how people are a feeling about the exams basically. So you don't necessarily have to do these, but perhaps you could imagine you're a foundation year business student who's about to sit uh, uh, an exam on statistics. And uh, well, I think if I remember the results, then perhaps nervous and scared was uh, around the top ones. So yeah, nervous, scared, yeah. Uh, and then maybe they were one or two excited, can't quite remember. So then we'll see, uh, here's an example of something that they could answer. So let's switch back to the way I would have presented this. So uh, I would have presented this like, so there's the question, give them a little time to think about it or do some calculations. Then I would open the poll like so, and they would have some chance to enter it. So, so I haven't given you the, uh, the amount of time you would need to produce an answer. So let's just uh, skip this one. So this is an exam style question. And uh, so they get shown some data and they get asked to draw a stem and leaf diagram. And then maybe you're uh, sitting there thinking, uh, how on earth am I going to enter a stem and leaf diagram into VBOX? Well, this is the kind of thing they might have produced. And that's actually what I produced when I was giving them the instruction. And, but we can see there are some features of this stem and leaf diagram that we might be able to use uh, to construct a poll. So the polls then, the next poll questions, uh, ask things like, how many stems are there? Which uh, if you have a photographic memory, you might be able to remember how many stems there were from this. I'm not expecting you to be able to answer these. These are just here. Uh, as examples, 
to get worth seven. And then we also could ask the question, which stem had the most leaves? But we could in turn to here and see there were more numbers of deaths in the 40s than any other. So this is basically how I ran the session. And uh, after the session, they were asked to complete a survey uh, because I needed some data for my project. And uh, so, so here then are the outcomes. And uh, then, well, I was actually surprised just how much help uh, the students needed. And so I had to sort of guide them through pretty much everything in order to get any answers. But this was okay. I mean, it was kind of better than not knowing that, uh, knowing that they needed this extra help. And so perhaps uh, one of the best things about the session was I kind of didn't anticipate just how much excitement it was going to produce. Uh, there was whooping and clapping as people got told they got told by Vbox that they had the right answer. Uh, a very excitable crowd. Um, so. And then both in the survey results and also in the quantitative analysis, uh, everyone reported uh, positive experiences. So in particular, we could draw out some comments from the interviews uh, where people said they liked the immediate feedback and interactivity of the experience. And I mean, of course, we can't sort of claim any causal relationship here, but uh, people did do better in the exam but uh, I'm not going to make any big claims there, but that did happen. So. so here then are the sort of quantitative results. So we had uh, sort of two questions looking at kind of effort they put in before and afterwards to judge uh, about participation. So here then we see that, um, you know, uh, quite a lot of people said they only put in half the effort. And then we look at uh, after, or during the VBOX session, uh, people said, uh, most people said they put in uh, more effort, and some people said they put in quite a lot more. So that's the participation question. Uh, so then a sort of question about why does it work? And so perhaps we're thinking it's to do with uh, they like being knowing that they get the correct answer. And we can see that uh, the majority of people said that they did like getting the correct answer. Uh, there was also this speculation that people might uh, sort of like the idea of uh, sort of being part of a crowd and uh, sort of everyone getting the, the correct answer together, but people seem to be less bothered about that. because so, they were all in the same classroom. And then there's this uh, questions about, uh, did this sort of build confidence? So, because uh, uh, part of the issue also with this module was lots of people hadn't sat the exam the year before. And so trying to build people's confidence um, was important so they would actually have a go at uh, taking the main assessment. So here we see then that uh, some people was, had some confidence before the session, and this is perhaps the best result uh, was this you know, a lot of, we didn't have anybody who was feeling very confident before, but uh, a good third of the class was feeling very confident afterwards, and only a small percentage of the class uh, were, were perhaps lacking in confidence. So that, that was perhaps the, the top result for the, uh, for the project. So uh, the second project, um, I'll run through this one pretty quickly. It was kind of just different objectives and sort of uh, to try and get people involved in uh, problem solving, different set of students. Uh, so it was just math students, no business. And, uh, and mainly, or a lot about this project was to try and identify whether we had students who were struggling with basic algebra. And so it worked pretty well for that. We could just basically see how many students couldn't answer the problems, whilst also getting them to try some problems. So, but the Vibox, the Vibox was pretty similar again, uh, similar style, just more questions. And, uh, and we have found that they've been pretty good this year at their algebra. So I quickly then run through some of the highlights. Uh, for me, using it in maths, uh, the fact that the latex is, is very, Beautifully rendered means that you know it, it, it is feasible for me to use it 
uh, pretty much in all contexts of my teaching. Uh, these two question types are basically pretty much all my questions are either numeric or multi-choice, uh, some flexibility. Uh, I use the import-export a lot because sometimes I don't get to use the question when I was expecting and I can shift, move it into a quiz and uh, that, that kind of thing. And uh, this was really important for my project, the fact that we could have live polling and then a survey at the end meant that everybody who was involved in the session uh, answered the survey, which for other people in their action research projects, they didn't find the same level of participation in their surveys. Uh, challenges I found is that uh, yeah, uh, VBOX takes up time during a lecture, and uh, and so we have to be sort of careful about you know uh, how much we use it. But I, I'm pretty sure that the time we devote to our VBOX sessions, uh, we're well rewarded in terms of outcomes. So we have had some complaints about this from students. Uh, so I actually ran. Uh, a survey not in VBOX because I've done, I'd run the survey in VBOX before. Who likes using VBOX? But um, the irony was a bit much for me. So we actually ran a question in our formal module evaluation system this time around, and VBOX won 19 won. Uh, so that's breaking news, only released yesterday. So this justifies my use of it going forward, which I was very pleased about to get that result yesterday. So we'll finish uh, with a few little tricks. So some of you who are used to using VBOX might have noticed that I was able to make mathematics very big in my first poll and, uh, and blue, which is something you can't necessarily do without using LaTeX uh, within uh, VBOX. And so you can sort of just use LaTeX to do uh, formatting tricks. And for anybody, who's used to using um, LaTeX, then I was very pleased to find that you could use display style within your questions, which made my integrals and quotients and summations uh, much prettier. So, uh, um, and pretty much you can use all the formatting tricks above in your LaTeX mathematics. And so you can present things very much like you would uh, say on a piece of paper or in a Beamer presentation like this one. Uh, there are a few things that one gets uh, a little bit, uh, you know, it would be nice to have this. And uh, I have been talking to the VBOX team about uh, three decimal places would be very nice for questions involving probability and correlation coefficients and discussions ongoing. And also in some cases, you know, we're being able to answer questions in terms of multiples of pi or square roots of two would be good if you want an exact answer. Uh, many questions have more than one answer. And so kind of it'd be nice to be able to say, you know, uh, enter all the solutions. Uh, but um, you saw uh, in my very first uh, question earlier that I actually came up with that idea just this morning as to how to narrow things down sometimes. And I suppose anybody who is perhaps going to be trying to use it in the teaching of physics, I uh, would certainly like to be able to ask questions in the form of uh, something times 10 to the power n. Uh, for me, uh, perhaps the most uh, one that I think it would be a nice to have would be able to be able to set a preamble, because in my actual, you know, in the rest of my teaching materials, uh, I use these shorthands a lot, and it makes the LaTeX look much tidier. So I think that might be it. Uh, yes, a little summary. Uh, so what I found is it definitely increases participation in my active learning exercises. And uh, all anecdotal and uh, uh, qu qu quantitative uh, assessment shows that students enjoy it. And for me in particular, getting some insight into how well people are learning the material are or, or aren't. Um, is perhaps uh, one of the major parts. And I think we have improved learning outcomes, uh, difficult to show uh, with absolute certainty, but that is my take on it.
Fantastic. Thank you very much, Alex. That was really interesting. And I was thinking earlier, actually, that I don't think we've ever run a type of webinar session before or really looked at Bvox kind of in and around the use of mass with the kind of LaTeX um, integration there. So I think certainly for other users out there who could potentially use this in their own maths teaching and also you know touching on the realms of sort of science and, and sort of physics based subjects you know it's a particularly useful functionality within the bbox platform and i'm so grateful that you're able to give up your time today alex to, to come and really talk to us about it and, and obviously the the uh, the impact that it's had on your own on your own teaching um, really appreciate that and I thought that was a brilliant presentation so thank you very much I'm just going to use this as an opportunity um, as always just to plug our YouTube channel a little bit here so the recording of this session will actually eventually be on our YouTube channel so if you want to watch this back in the future um, or if you want to potentially circulate this with, with any colleagues as well then do please watch out for that um, and also head over to uh, to the channel to sign up and subscribe as well so that you can be kept up to date on the latest and greatest content we do post pretty regularly on there with lots of tips and tricks videos and general kind of webinars and things that we produce so definitely you know if you are a, uh, a consistent vbox user then i would definitely recommend having a look at that the other thing I would mention is you can also sign up to our newsletter as well. Um, you can find that on our website. And again, that will just keep you in the loop on the latest content and functionality coming to the platform. But with that, Alex, I think, like I say, if it's OK with you, we'll, we'll have a look at a few questions that I've seen come through on the Vivox Q&A. So I'm just going to bring that on screen for a second here. Uh, obviously, we won't go through every single one, just being conscious of time, uh, but we'll have a look at some of these most popular ones that have come through here. Um, so the first one here is, have you found engagement increase with Vbox? Do you mainly use it anonymously? So I know you've kind of talked about the engagement piece um, quite a bit there, Alex, and I think it's evident from the reporting yeah. that you had that it has actually had a impact on that within your teaching. Um, in terms of the anonymity element, um, did you maybe want to touch upon that a little bit as well and just the uh, the general kind of uh, engagement increase that you found within using the tool? Yeah, I only use it anonymously. And then when we asked in our survey, you know, was the anonymity important to them? I think, yeah, I, I seem to remember, you know, in the, in the interviews, everyone said it, it was important to them and they were more likely uh, to yep. use it knowing that it was anonymous. Uh, so, so, in terms of engagement assessment, is that when I ask a, a question involving the VROC, then if I look out, then I see much more people uh, participating in the activity uh, and focused, you know, uh, than, than if I just, you know, say, have a go at doing these sums or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's um, that's a very good point, Alex. And you, you kind of mentioned earlier as well about not kind of using it too much. So there's kind of a balance to be struck as well with with using Vbox because obviously, you know, we're going to um, champion and be advocates for uh, for our product, obviously. But actually, we're not, you know, kind of encouraging and stipulating yeah. that it should be used all the time at the same time as well. So, yeah. you know, it's kind of striking that balance between utilizing it when and where it makes sense but not kind of only over stimulating the, the students at the same time um, but obviously pleased to hear in, in your case that it seems to have had a you know on the whole way uh, a, a positive impact and with the anonymity i think you know again i would pretty much agree with, with what you said there generally through the power that the anonymity element offers you are generally going to find that students will become more engaged and more likely to to kind of get involved with the content um, you know, when they're not specifically tying their name to to something as such. But uh, yeah, no, that's great. Thank you, Alex. And, and thank you for the question as well. Uh, we'll have a look at a few more here. So um, someone's posted here, how do you use VBOX to measure success with your students? Do you get statistics at the end of each session? So I can obviously answer that a little bit as well. But um, what's your kind of view on that, Alex? Uh, I mean, I didn't really use it in that way. Uh, I just, you know, my classes weren't that big, and so I could just see, you know, where, well, you know, the, the, <clears throat> like if more than half the people got the questions right, then 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 I'm kind of happy, you know. Uh, yeah. So so I mean, I have other ways of you know measuring people's actual performance, which we do through you know uh, formal assignments and stuff. So uh, so this is more just like a, a quick feel. You know, uh, so it'd be like, uh, no one's answering my question on such and such. 
uh, I obviously didn't, you know, teach that as clearly as I hoped. You know, that 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 that's sure. more more the way I'm teaching. No, that's great. I mean, you, you can certainly use Beavers to kind of get that, you know, general kind of feel of what's happening with, with the students. But to answer that a little bit further um, to whoever's posted this, you, you can actually get quite um, in depth with the data analysis. So for those that don't know, within a VVOC session that you've run, you can go in and then really kind of analyze the data so you can see the overall levels of engagement, uh, the participation rate from the students. You can see, you know, how many students have actually been getting involved with the content. And if you're running your session in a way that you're identifying the students, you can even then isolate that down to individual students as well. So, you know, of course, not everyone is going to want or need to do that, but you do have that level of functionality available to you, as well as the fact that you can export all of the data out of the platform as well um, into a, a downloadable Excel file. So you can really kind of, you know, make of that what you will. You can get quite uh, in depth on the analysis, but also, you know, you can use the kind of general um, sense of the room to engage its effectiveness at the same time. So yeah, thank you for the question, um, whoever sent that one in. Uh, we'll have a look at a couple more here. I know we're um, just at time now, but uh, we have had a few interesting questions in here. So let's have a look at this one. So someone's posted, do you ever use VBOX for producing asynchronous content for students as well, i.e. through surveys? So yeah, Alex, what's your, uh, what's your view on that one? So I did. Uh... So in my module, the probability one, last semester, I kind of thought, well, some people come in late and miss the, the polls, so I'll move the questions into a quiz, which they can do in their own time. Um, but I stopped doing it when participation levels weren't very high. So yeah, do I need to be more clear than that? So, I mean, people weren't using them, so I stopped doing it. So. Uh, uh, it was kind of a shame because I then went to extra effort to use the sort of explain answer feature because I thought that was a really nice feature, you know, that people can do offline. So I'd show, you know, how you get to the solution. So, I mean, certainly the software is good, uh, but but I didn't do very well at convincing the students to find it. <laughs> How about that? So, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's fine, Alex. So I, I, I... From 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 your point there, you kind of generally feel that the the live poll is where you get the most interaction. And although you have been using the surveys um, here and there, you typically find that the most engagement comes through when you're actually physically, yeah. you know, live. And okay, yeah. I mean, the yeah. surveys no. were really the surveys were really useful for my action research projects. You know, uh, so you know, so assessing you know what people thought of the experience, they were vital for you know. Uh, yeah. Uh, but actually helping people with learning their maths, I thought they should be really good, but I <laughs> yet yet to work out how to convince people to to try them. I mean, yeah, I, I, I guess it's also you know subject specific a little bit as well. You know that there, there may be different applications within different you know subject matters, but the the beauty of the service is that they're kind of multiple applications for them that they can be used for kind of collating feedback and uh, sentiment analysis from the students really understanding you know whether they've understood the content and that kind of thing as well as the kind of um, practical uh, applications of them as well so using them for you know assessments and, and quizzes and that kind of thing so you do have a few different things with the service there but you know at the same time it, it's really open to, uh, to to use what you choose to use within the platform and what really works for for yourself. So that's great, Alex. Thanks uh, again for your, uh, for your input and opinion on that one there. Um, we'll maybe do potentially one or two more questions, guys, just, just to uh, have a look at some of these ones here. Um, so someone said, can you format one slide in a PowerPoint presentation um, and appoint it to all slides? I can take this one, but I'm just going to read the question again to make sure I'm fully understanding this here. So can you format one slide in a PowerPoint presentation and appoint it to all slides? So effectively, you do have the ability to use VVox in PowerPoint, first of all, which is probably obviously the nature of this question here. So we do have an add-in that will allow you to produce the, uh, the live polling and examples of what you've looked at today, but directly from a PowerPoint presentation. Um, in terms of if you can use that in a slide and apply it to all slides, the way that that works is effectively the VVox add-in will um, build around your content that's there. So if you've created a slide master, 
that has your theme applied to it and you know your color palette and any shapes or images that you might have on there um, within Microsoft PowerPoint um, this is referring to our new beta PowerPoint add-in when you then come to bring in your VBox content it will work around the content that you have there but because it's PowerPoint and it's completely customizable you can then choose to you know apply that layout to uh, to the relevant slide so you do have a lot more control with the PowerPoint add-in um, is one of the main sort of pros and, and benefits to it over say the dashboard and the present view um, but there's never a right or wrong answer with with which one you have to use there um, but in effect yes you uh, you can absolutely do that Okay, so I'm just going to have a look through some of these other questions here. Um, I'm just maybe going to cherry pick this one at the bottom because someone said, have you used any other poll types other than the ones you've shown? So obviously I know Alex, you've shown kind of a lot of numeric questions, obviously uh, makes sense, as well as things like the multiple choice. Um, have you kind of dabbled within any of the other questions much at all, just out of interest? Uh, I use the other ones for icebreakers. I really like the word cloud. Of course. Uh, yeah. And uh, and the ratings, and I, I really like to have a go at the sort of click on image ones, you know. Or I, I mean, I remember seeing those demonstrated to me by Jim here, and thinking, oh, I could definitely use that, but um, but I haven't to my. Uh, you know, okay. But let's say that's yeah. still on my. Yet to be. Yet to be discovered. No, that's that's great, Alex. I think. Um, yeah, the pin on image is an interesting one, actually, because it has so many applications in so many different areas, you know, outside of the standardized um, applications of what you would imagine, you can use it for kind of um, getting the students to identify, you know, key trends on charts and that kind of thing. And yeah, uh, yeah it's definitely it's definitely quite a, a, a versatile one. And obviously, yes, you did have your word cloud um, at the start as well, obviously, which, you know, like you said, serves fantastic icebreakers um, and just to plug. Bruce White, once again, he actually ran uh, a brilliant session last year all about icebreakers, which, like I said, if you haven't seen, um, you can watch that back from our YouTube channel um, and see his kind of thoughts um, around the, the icebreakers specifically and the work clouds. Um, but yeah, once again, thank you very much for, um, for the question. Um, and I think, guys, just because I know we are a little bit over on time now, um, I'm going to leave this here and just say a big thank you once again, Alex, for, uh, for giving up your time today. Um, I really enjoyed your, your presentation and, and talk, and, and obviously it's been a, a pleasure to kind of uh, uh, work and, and put this together over the past sort of week or so. Um, so really appreciate that. Um, if anybody does have any final questions for um, for Alex, then feel free to obviously uh, field those through to us, and I'm sure Alex will be more than happy to uh, to give his uh, his take and, and opinion on those. Um, but yeah, that's it from from me for now, guys. So that also concludes the end of our spring webinar series for for this year. So like I say. If you have missed any of the previous sessions, then do please feel free to have a look at our YouTube channel to watch any of those back. Uh, but other than that, we'll be coming back with our uh, next series, you know, towards uh, the, the latter half of the year. Um, so watch out for more uh, updates from us. But um, until then, thank you very much, guys. Um, really appreciate your time. Hope it's been a useful session. Um, enjoy the rest of your day and week and we'll catch you all soon.